with you this uh, Sunday morning, February the 16th. Um, there's a few things that I want to do on the front end of our, of our sermon today, but I just want to, I want to tell you that yesterday uh, we had a men's breakfast here, and that was just, that was great. That was a, a great time. Uh, 26, was it? 20, 22, 23 men gathered, and um, we ate, and then some of us went fishing, and uh, that was a great time also. I had a, a <laughs> I said before we went, I said, you watch. I'm going with these other two guys who are, are, are good fishermen. I'm like, they're going to catch all the fish, and I'm not going to catch anything. And we get to the river, and we busted through the ice so that we could get out to the water, and the one guy throws his line in the water. First, first cast, wham, he slams a steelhead. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. For the next two and a half hours, Joe navigated ice and slush and no fish. <laughs> well, they kept catching all the fish. But what, a, what an opportunity to be out there. You know, yesterday morning, it was negative nine at my house when I left uh, the home. You know, it was so cold when you breathe, it freezes everything, and, uh, and then to have the sun come out and warm things right up, and uh, just a, a great day outside. I'm really grateful for those opportunities. They don't come often enough for my liking, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to be out and just experience the beauty of God and all that, all that is around us. So we had started a tradition, and I, and I didn't do this last week, and forgive me for that, but... How have you been impacted by God in the last week or two? Or where have you seen God? This is your chance to to give a little testimony, or as we like to say at Park Church, a testimony, right? Uh, Monies are long things, minis are very short and sweet. But um, how have you seen God, church? And what has God done in your lives that was miraculous? Jess. Jess. And bringing women into the center. Praise God. Options Care Center, that is. For those of you that don't know. Yeah. Where else have we seen God at work? Answers prayers in strange ways. That is true. Greg. Yeah, amen, for protection, yeah. Where else have we seen the miraculous? Josette? One more time? Through the joy that you have through your grandchildren. Amen. If you're a grandparent, it's a, it's a whole new world, right? They should write a song about that. Uh, it is a whole different, it's, it's just awesome. We saw ours last night, and... Uh, Yep. Where else? Confirmation in healing. Yeah, so you received healing. Amen. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to know about healing, you see Kelly Wittenbrook. She was healed by God. True story. Yeah. What else? His provisions. Yeah. We have time for a couple of more. Yeah, candy. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 
One more. Yeah, Roy. Yeah. 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 Did you yeah, you, yeah, you can clap for that. That was that's our communities that we live in. Yeah. So uh Roy's story was a, a homeless man came into a restaurant in t- in downtown Jamestown uh to get warm. Waitress noticed him sitting there and brought him a cup of hot tea. Others recognized kind of what was taking place and uh, provided the provision to, to pay for a meal so that he had a, a warm meal and a place to, to warm himself that evening. Yeah. Yeah. You see, um, sometimes we think God is only in these big, grandiose things. And uh, if that's where the only spot where you're looking to see God, you might go a long time uh, between sightings. Because, friends, I'm, I'm here to tell you today that uh, God is in the business of everyday life. He's present in every little thing that you do. He's present with you in the morning when you brush your teeth. He's present with you uh, in the evening when you uh, neglect even to maybe say prayer. He's present with you all the time. What takes place in ourselves is a shifting of how we see things. And we begin to look at the world through God's lens. I would encourage you to continue to look for Jesus everywhere you turn. Today we are going to um, come to the, the seventh beatitude, and we've been unpacking them two by two as we go, and, and today we have a standalone one by itself. And uh, I think you'll see why it stands alone in just a few minutes, but um, I'd like to just uh, open up with a word of prayer and invite you to pray for me this morning. Holy God, thank you for this place that we have gathered to worship and to witness and to testify, and now, Lord, where we've uh, come to receive. Lord, you've, uh, you've begun the work already, and your word tells us that you are faithful to seeing it on a completion. So God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be a pleasing offering to you, but Lord, may they be the words you use to minister to your people, to impact life among your people. But God, whether through me or in spite of me, you just continue to do your thing, that you might receive glory and honor and praise, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You remember the Beatitudes are uh, state in essence, the bliss or the joy or the happiness of being a Christian. Oh, the joy of following Christ. Oftentimes when we read the Beatitudes, we think it's some, some lofty thing that we're going to obtain in the future in the obscure distance, right? But the Beatitudes are about a very real present reality that God brings among us who are Christians. And they they state and they they bring a, a sense of the sheer joy of following Jesus Christ as not only Master and Savior, but also as Lord. And you remember I've uh, been using this language uh, periodically, but reminding you that you cannot have Jesus as Savior if you're not willing to accept Him as Lord. And you can take that to the bank. That you cannot have Jesus as Savior if you're not willing to accept Him and receive Him as Lord. The two cannot be parsed apart. Try as we may at times. You see, the the very form of the Beatitudes is this joyous statement. It's kind of like this wild ride where we experience sorrow, there's comfort. Where the meek inherit the earth. Someone asked me, why would we want to inherit the earth? I have an answer. That's our final destination. We want to inherit the earth. She's not even here this morning. I'm going to have to tell her that privately. She's been asking me each week, why, Pastor Joe, why do we want to inherit the earth? The Beatitudes um, were given by Jesus to the disciples in a private setting up on the mount, right? And uh, Matthew's gospel unpacks these uh, mini sermons and puts them in a nice, neat spot for us. But the Sermon on the Mount is not just one, com- one sermon that Jesus preached. It's a collection of sermons put together. 
And um, the Beatitudes was this, um, it was the beginning of ministry for them. And, and Jesus, um, this is kind of the ordination service where he's preparing them to go. And for those of us that are Christ followers, you need to hear these words from Christ and then receive what God has. It's a two-part thing. Today we uh, unpack Matthew's gospel, uh, I think it's chapter 5 and verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. When you hear the word peace, what comes to mind? This is interactive. This helps keep you, keep you awake. You never know if you're going to get called on. What comes to mind when you hear the word peace? Calm. That's a good one. What else? Relaxing. Yeah. What else? Freedom. Lack of conflict. These are great words for peace. What else? Quiet. Yes. What else comes to mind when we think of peace? Contentment. Happy. We've got a lot of responses from this section. Is anybody else awake? When you hear the word peace, what comes to mind? Piece of cake. That's from the, one of the other preachers, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> There's cookies out there, Chuck. Uh, I think I heard trusting in God or resting in God, I think was what I heard also. Uh, what else? Lack of conflict. That's good. Two of you like that. Lack of conflict. Peace means lack of conflict. Okay, I want you to, to think for a moment with me and take all of your thoughts about peace and push the pause button. Push the pause button. Because uh, peace means something a little bit different to Jesus and these statements and what you've just shared. I want to invite you to turn, if you brought your Bibles, we're going to be in another spot also to kind of shed some light on this. You see, peacemakers in what Jesus is presenting has a clashing worldview that um, the, the worldview of is personal peace that's pursued without concern for the world's cause, right? So I want to have peace in my life. It's all about my needs and my desires, but that is nothing, that, that is so far from what Jesus is talking about. And if you notice, this is the first beatitude with um, a different kind of label attached to it, right? Blessed are the peace, what? Makers. Blessed are the peace makers. It's not passive. A peacemaker then becomes what? A child of God, it says. That's not my words, that's God's words for you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Leslie and I, are um, we've taken an interest in Labradors. And man, they're a great dog. I mean, my, our moose drives me a little bit nuts sometimes. But um, as a result of our interest in Labradors, we've also uh, found ourselves interested in DNA. Right? The, the chromosomal makeup of the dogs. Well, you each have DNA also. Um, I think 26, right? 26 chromosomes in a... Anyway, um, our biologists can help me with that later. But um, DNA is very important because what happens in DNA? We, are, we, we receive from our parents who we are, kind of, right? Your, your, your biological parents give you this DNA, and that's, that's why you're children of them. Children of God have God's DNA. I think it was Roy Miller one time who said something, and, and he's here today. He imparts great words of wisdom. Um, I think it was Roy Miller who said, God doesn't have any grandchildren. Nowhere in Scripture will you find God's grandchildren. God only has children. He can unpack the Greek for you, but the weoi or the weos, the children of God. That's you and I who are, who are peacemakers, the scripture says. 
They're called children of God. We, we take that and we take that DNA elsewhere, right? You know who my children are. If they were to stand up here, you would say, yep, that one belongs to him, that one belongs to him, that one kind of maybe belongs to him. <laughs> You'd look at Leslie and say, she definitely belongs to her. DNA means that we, we, we take that which has been given to us and, and we reflect it. It's part of us. You can't escape it. Colossians chapter 1. Peace is not so much about the absence of conflict or, or this surreal or serene state. Peace, rather, is about reconciliation. It's about restoration. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, and this is the, the great... Um, pitch from Paul as he paints the picture of who Jesus is, concludes that section with this saying, he says, and through him or through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood which was shed on the cross. There's this reconciliation that takes place in peace. Peace is only possible when we are active with it. And I want to um, invite you to think about a couple of different things. In the 60s and 70s, we had people who were really passionate about peace, didn't we? Were they peacemakers or did they just love peace? Now you're thinking, aren't you? I have a friend, his name's John. And... Um, John was very distant from the Lord, but had this idea of who God was. He grew up Native American, and um, the Longhouse was a, a tradition that he participated in and believed the teachings of. And um, John became very, very sick as a result of his service to our country. And John, um, John was at in the hospital, and. He was slated for open heart surgery, and uh, John was, is a big man. He's a big man, and he said to me when I walked in the room, and he wasn't looking real good, he said, Pastor, I, it, the end is near. The end is near. And um, he said the, the surgeons had to use a chainsaw to cut through my chest because it's so big. I'm like, well, I don't know if they used a chainsaw, but they definitely ripped him open from uh, stem to sternum. And and he said, there's no, there's no hope for me because of the things that I've done. But my hope is that there would be peace for others. And John, um, John was an active uh, military person during the conflict in Vietnam. And uh, on his first tour, when he returned home, he started down the, the stairway out of the plane and he turned around halfway down and started back up. Because those who were claiming to be peaceful were anything but peaceful. He said, I was safer over there. But they were lovers of peace. Some people are lovers of peace. This passage in Scripture does not say that we are to be lovers of peace. Because lovers of peace aren't necessarily peacemakers. They're simply lovers of peace. And it's usually, uh, usually weighted in a personal desire for serenity. And we have that clashing worldview where it's, where it's about myself and not necessarily the world chaos that is taking place around me. But all peacemakers are also lovers of peace. Do you see how that works? Not everybody who is a lover of peace is a peacemaker, but all peacemakers are lovers of peace. You can wrap your mind around that for a little while. And I want you to be thinking of one thing um, as we continue on for a few more minutes. Are you a, a peacemaker? Or do you simply love the idea of peace? Peace, my friends, is about reconciliation. I forget who said this, but um, you know, we long for the day when the lion will lay down with the lamb. And that day is going to come. Revelation makes that very clear. If you read the, the devotional through Lent, I tackled Revelation chapter 11, when the seventh trumpet is sounded. 
and there's victory, right? That's when the lion and the lamb will lay down together. What happens if the lion and the lamb lay down right now together? Lots of lambs get eaten. Lots of lambs get eaten. We are not there yet, friends. General MacArthur, after um, the conflict in World War II, made this statement as he announced his retirement to Congress then. He said this. He said that he was simply an old soldier who has tried to fulfill his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. And that duty, as he saw it, was to destroy in order to build up. Let's go back a few hundred years prior to that and we find um, Thomas Aquinas talking about war. He says, Be peaceful, therefore, in warring so that you may vanquish and bring them in the prosperity of peace. Or back up a little further yet to St. Augustine, who said, A just war is justified only in only in the injustice of an aggressor. And that injustice ought to be a source of grief to any good man, because it is a human injustice. The peacemakers... Know what is right, and they stand for it. Even if at times it means conflict, because they know the end is better. I want to invite you to think about. Um, one other passage in Scripture. I know I told you we'd have two, but um, we're really going to have three. I'm sorry about that. Some of you are asking yourselves, well, I, I think I'm tracking with you, Pastor Joe, but what does this look like in my everyday life? How do I become a peacemaker? Well, God's given you a pretty clear blueprint in, in the Word of God found in uh, Romans chapter 12, actually. And... Um, Romans, and I've said this numerous times, is, uh, this was actually Luther who said this, it's the purest of all Gospels. But um, if you were to read Romans, this is a, this is a book that you really want to commit to memory, right? Romans is a, is a book that, man, God, God just speaks to us through practical stuff, through theological things, in, in some real great ways. That was terrible English for you English teachers, real great, right? That's... But hear these words from Paul in Romans chapter 12, okay? And, and at the heart of peacemaking is really love, transformational love, right? Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, and we see this, it says, love must be sincere. So what do peacemakers do? They hate what is evil and they cling to what is good. What do peacemakers do? Paul says they are devoted to one another in brotherly love. They honor one another above themselves. What does a peacemaker do? They are never lacking in zeal. If you're not sure what the word zeal means, it means um, they're they're excitable or they're they're engaged actively in, in something. Right? In our faith, we're actively engaged in it. Peacemakers are never static. Peacemakers are never static. Peacemakers are joyful in hope and patient in affliction. Peacemakers rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Peacemakers, if at all possible, if at all possible, live in harmony with one another. In other words, they put the needs of others above their own at times, or even all the time. Peacemakers associate with people of low position. Let me say that one more time. Peacemakers associate with people of low position. Church, when was the last time you associated with someone of low position? Paul leaves a lot of room 
for interpretation here. God doesn't tell us who it is that are people of low position, does he? Our society might deem people of low position in the 21st century as poor people, as drug addicts, as ex-convicts or convicts, period, as adulterers, as fornicators. People of low position are people who culture says that's not a good thing. Right? Peacemakers associate with people of low position. Peacemakers always do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And peacemakers, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with some people. No. Peacemakers, if it is at all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Church, God invites you to not simply be one who loves this idea of peace. But God empowers you to actively be peacemakers, which means at times standing up for those who are not bringing peace, for those who are inflicting evil. It means at times surrendering your right to yourself to maybe even win an argument with your spouse. I know for some of us that's a challenging thing because we're the right ones. Peacemakers, as far as it depends on you, if at all possible, live at peace with everyone. Church, there's a fine line between being a lover of peace and a maker of peace. One is static and one is active. Which one are you? Would you pray with me? Holy God, thank you for today. Lord, may we, your church, come alive today by the power of your Holy Spirit to be peacemakers in the world at large around us, not because of anything that we have done, but because we are children of God whom you have reconciled by your blood, Jesus. Father, may those of us whom, whom love and, and, and whom peace is a, is a distant thought, may we be caught up in your presence right now in this moment. Lord, we long for the day when the lion will lay down with the lamb. But until that day comes, may we be, may we be faithful and initiating peace. Standing for what is right. In love. In the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.